this session, what we're going to do is we're going to look uh, and continue to look at uh, discerning of spirits. So this is the second part of what we have commenced on discerning of spirits. We've stated that a Christian uh, can be possessed, and I know there will be a lot of different views on that. But in this study, we shall recap what possession is and look at the strength of demonic strongholds how possession and oppression can occur, and how to recognize possession, and how to break its influences. One of the things we need to understand is that demons do possess the body. The body is corrupt, the body is subject to sin, the body will die. When I'm born again, my body isn't born again, but my spirit is. And so demons like to try and influence the spiritual outcome of an individual by possessing the body and trying to exert influence over a person's soul and therefore change his destiny and change his life here. We need to understand that. Now, so what we're saying then is this, that demons require a physical body of some sort in order to find expression in some way. That's how they do it, because they're spirit beings. Their total bent is to destroy or to bring a person into bondage. By their possession, therefore, they influence the activities of the individual that they are possessing. The fact that this discerning of spirits is a gift, just like other gifts uh, are for the church, suggests that demonic discernment in the area of possession or oppression is for Christians. And if it's for Christians, it has to be for ministry because nothing that is given to us in our life, our Christian life, is for ourselves. It's always for the body. Now, if it was impossible for Christians to be possessed or oppressed, then really the gift is of no value to the church and is only good for the unbeliever. Now, I think that would be particularly dangerous because once it's cleaned out, if the demon returns and finds nothing else replacing where it has been, he brings seven others worse than himself. So Matthew uh, chapter 12, verses 43 to 45 tell us. So that in a person would be in a worse state than they originally were if it were principally for uh, unbelievers. Now Job was righteous and yet he himself was demonically aff afflicted. We read that in Job chapter 1 verse 8 and chapter 2 verse 7. It is with the tools of the spirit therefore, that we come against these spiritual forces. As we've quoted previously in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, Zechariah says, It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds. A stronghold is something that captures us and holds us prisoner. And it's particularly there talking about strongholds in our minds. But what is the strength of some of these strongholds that we're dealing with? Kevin Simpangi, uh, in his book, Reign of Terror, Reign of Love, he talks about witch doctors sitting in fires to make their proclamations without being burnt? The answer to this is from a converted witch in page 63 of that same book is, the fire is the home of the devil and he allows all his students to sit with him. Interesting, isn't it? I know uh, in missional activity within Africa, it's a country that we're working, that um, very often, uh, you know, in tr more traditional churches that are not uh, uh, practicing exorcism, that when people know they're troubled by a spirit, they work, walk, will actually walk past the church and go find a witch doctor. There are different kinds of witch doctors. There's white witches and black witches. And so they'll go to the ones that they go to 
that they request good from rather than the other ones that they request uh, either a curse to be placed upon an individual that they don't like or things of that nature. But one of the things that we definitely see is this, that oppression causes sickness. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus of Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and power, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Sickness is caused uh, by Satan, but a stronger force is available to us in Christ. So if a stronger force is available to us in Christ and sickness is caused by Satan, then we should have some authority over sickness. That makes sense, doesn't it? In Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 16, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was, he leapt upon them, he overpowered them. And so the seven sons of Sceva rushed off because they were overcome by the man in whom the demon was. Again, we see here the strength of demonic power when a man is possessed. I remember in the early days of our ministry, we had just begun the church and a young man came in and uh, severely, severely oppressed. And in actual fact, as it turned out, he was possessed. And this man was having a trouble with homosexuality. And as we began to exercise the spirit, we had numerous people just holding him down, arms and legs, as we exercised the spirit from him. And so later on, he was baptized. And I believe that today he's following Jesus. And that was some 40 odd years ago. Another example is found in Matthew 17, uh, 14 to 18. Jesus returned from the Mount of Transfiguration. And there he encountered a demon possessed boy. Now, if we compare the gospel records, uh, one says he was lunatic, another epileptic, another blind and dumb. In fact, he could have been all of those. But what it shows us is the primary power of control, that a demon controls a person physically, and uh, that can either be by sickness or some other way. But how, in, and I guess this is a question that we all need to ask, how does one become possessed or oppressed. In Christians, inevitably, this is because of the activity that they have been involved in before they come to Christ. Now, I want to say here are some areas that we will uh, cover right now, which I think everybody seems to have some understanding of at any rate, that these things which are forbidden by Scripture, if we practice them, um, then we are more likely to be subject to possession or oppression. So there's Ouija boards, palmistry, astrology, tarot card reading, divination, extrasensory possession, numerology, seances, calling up familiar spirits, spiritism and homosexuality. These are some of the common ones that we encounter today. There's also the initiation into false cults. I mean, Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, Moonies, Children of God, are just a, a few of these false cults that do not honour Jesus as being God manifest in the flesh. Uh, Satan worship, black magic and white magic, and Eastern mysticism and its numerous derivatives, and just for example, astral travel, transcendental meditation, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, Animism, 
Kundalini Yoga is one, and I don't know if ever you've, any of you have ever witnessed Kundalini Yoga, but uh, once they get those uh, seven chakras all uh, in line in the body with the spirit that is in the earth, there's like this primordial scream that comes forth, and it just makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It's uh, really something, something else. Drug addiction, not drug dealt with numerous drug addiction, uh, numerous people who are drug addicted. There was uh, a couple of young ladies who came to the Lord under our ministry, and uh, they were twins, actually, and identical twins. And um, they had been involved in drugs and all sorts of other activities that the Bible prohibits. We won't go into those, but... At any rate, there came a day for me to exercise the spirits that were in these people, these two. And uh, with one, uh, she was rolling around the floor and holding her head and saying, oh, I've got this pain in my head, I've got this pain in my head. And, uh, when, the, and when we exercised the demon, the pain in the head left. The other twin sister as we were exercising her she was rolling around the floor and she was crying out oh I have this pain in my feet the pain in my feet the pain in my feet and then when the demon left the pain in her feet went and I was asking the Lord about this one why did the demons congregate in the head and one in the feet and the other and uh, the Spirit spoke to me, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, that was the point of entry. And I said, what do you mean, the point of entry? He said, well, when this one was born, she was born head first, the other one was born feet first. And uh, so I, I mused upon that for a little bit. And uh, so I went to the mother and I said to the mother, was so-and-so born head first and the other one feet first? She said, yes, how could you possibly know that? And I said, oh, well, it just became evident in the exorcism. The, the mother had been born again. The grandmother had been born again in this particular family, real household salvation. But the thing was that there was a history in this family of involvement in, uh, in a religion that we could, as we call it, uh, that was uh, quite frankly... Um, the parents were involved and the grandparents involved in placing curses upon themselves at their initiation um, into those particular religious societies. And so initiation into secret societies where oaths have to be sworn involving a curse on the individual for divulging anything that belongs to the group, they are very serious uh, places uh, in relation to one's picking up these demonic things. Now, some cults have the same initiation rites, for example, Mormons, that they will not reveal any of the secrets of this, the first token of the Aaronic priesthood with its accompanying nine sign or penalty. Should we do so? Their initiation rite goes, we agree that our throats be cut from ear to ear and our tongues be torn out by the roots. And as they do this, they draw their thumb across their throat to show the penalty. This initiation rite is almost identical with the initiation rite into the apprentice level of the Blue Lodge, the Freemasonry. And so... You know, the fact of the matter is that you present and you take a curse upon yourself if you divulge anything and, and you have to be very careful. Jesus tells us, let your yes be yes and let your no be no, okay? We have to be very careful for the words that we speak, uh, particularly in relation to cursing. In Matthew 5, chapter 33 to 34, the scripture says, we're to swear by nothing on the earth or above be earth, let our yes be yes. So what are some of the telltale signs 
of those who are spiritually oppressed or possessed. Well, one thing is that they aren't able to stand the presence of God and they'll feel like running from the presence of God uh, during services if they come in during a particularly a worship and a praise time. And I remember back uh, in the early days of our, of our church, you know, we would just stand and we'd praise and we'd worship for an hour before anything else occurred in the sentence and the, in the service and we'd be lifting our hands, some people would be dancing and uh, there was a real revivalist sort of atmosphere in, in the church and I, I would see people come in and I think I haven't seen them before. They may have been inquirers and they would sit, uh, we were meeting in a picture theatre in those days, sit down, take a, take a seat, very comfortable and uh, but you'd see this discomfort come uh, into their faces as we as we were praying as we were worshiping as we were singing and particularly when we started to sing in the spirit and i've seen people just jump up and run to the end of the aisle and head out the doors and in those days they were swinging doors because you couldn't lock the doors and uh, they would just belt into those I thought on many occasions that the, the doors would come off and they'd be flapping and smacking their, uh, one another and uh, as they left the building in such a hurry, showing us a clean pair of heels as they exit. You know, anything that's demonic cannot stand the activity of the presence of God. Not a sign of those who may be spiritually possessed or oppressed is a constant lack of control in the particular uh, area of life. Um, they may be uh, driven in a compulsive way. People can be compulsive uh, liars, for instance. And uh, I've seen that have a marked effect upon people. Others may uh, always feel like they're driven by some existential uh, pressure and they often do t things which they know are intrinsically wrong and um, you know and, and those people those, those can be helped particularly if they're oppressed or possessed by a, a demon addiction addictions of any kind really um, you can see uh, with addictive behavior um, people have lost control uh, people with addictions sort of very frequently have a singular focus, uh, a compulsive focus on certain activities and those activities can be very evidential of a sign of oppression or possession. Uh, you know, it just might be drugs. We've talked about drugs and addiction to drugs, but there are other things that people can be addicted to like pornography, um, and uh, nail biting, you know, but I'm not saying that somebody that nail bites is necessarily oppressed or, or possessed. One of the things that you often see with um, demonic possession when you start ministering to the people is some people that are um, possessed, their eyes will roll back and their heads, they may start frothing at the mouth and have violent muscle movements. We can read about this in Mark 9 verse 20. But I remember uh, some years ago at our seminary in, um, in Myanmar, Yangon, in the city of Yangon. <clears throat> and uh, this young man, I was ministering in the Bible college and this young man who was attending uh, Bible college, he came up on the uh, stage because we had a lot forward for the baptism that night in the Holy Spirit and this young man came up on the stage and uh, as soon as I laid my hands upon him his eyes rolled into the back of his head so I just left him for a moment I went down and spoke to the principal of the Bible college and I said this young man I said on stage 
I said, what's his background? He said, oh, well, um, he was a Buddhist monk for many years and he's come, he was saved, he's come into the seminary, he, wants, he feels a call to the ministry of Jesus Christ. I said, well, just keep an eye on me because I think he could manifest quite violently and just quickly explain what had happened. So he kept an eye on me. I went back up on the stage, laid my hands on him again and started to pray for him. Well, the next, and what I did was, if I feel somebody might manifest and, and I don't have anybody else that's actually praying with me at that particular time, what I like to do is just grab their wrists and as I'm praying with them and sort of hold their hands up towards the Lord. And this is what I was doing. And the next minute he threw me. And I mean, he did throw me. And uh, I thought, hello, here it is. It's on for young and old. And I started coming now uh, after him in the name of Jesus, taking the, uh, the spirit that was within him and casting it out. At that moment, James, who had been keeping an eye on me, looked and he, he rushed up on stage and we both uh, joined in the exorcism. And when this uh, spirit, uh, this religious spirit, this deceptive religious spirit and the spirit of idol uh, idolatry uh, had come out of him, he was immediately baptised in the Holy Spirit and his face lit up and uh, we knew that God had done a work in him. And he actually became one of our most successful uh, evangelists working well for the Lord. One of the things I've also noted about people that have been involved in any form of witchcraft is the tendency to rock. And I remember this young woman that we had, uh, she'd been saved out of witchcraft. Both she and her sister had been saved out of witchcraft. And we'd, she'd come to a prayer meeting and we might all be sitting on the floor and she'd rock with her almost a forehead going down to the, the floor in front and the back of her head as she rocked back and forth. I remember watching her um, on, on numerous occasions thinking there's going to have to be something that's dealt with here, uh, but we'll just keep an eye on her and see what happens because the, the, the rocking was quite grotesque. At any rate, it all came to a head one night in a prayer meeting. We were all standing around praying and uh, suddenly I felt something whish through my hair and uh, I opened my eyes immediately. I might add I had hair in those days and uh, her, it, what she had done was she had her arm and she was a big built girl. She had her arm extended right out and her fist clenched and was going to take my head off and it would have given me a nasty knock had it collected. But the thing was, at that point, a young man standing next to me happened to open his eyes and he saw what was happening. He just threw his arm up and it deflected her arm through my hair. Well, it was then on for young and old as we exercised and uh, the demon of witchcraft out of her. And it, it took a little bit of time, but there were a number of people there that were prepared to hold and assist as we took authority over that demon. Now, one of the things that you'll often find about people that are particularly uh, badly infested is that they're unable to stand the mention of the name of Jesus or his blood. So they are something that we frequently utilize is the name of Jesus, because in the name of Jesus there is authority over demons. And we always cover people with the blood because the blood is efficacious so that those demons do not attack anybody else in the room when they're exorcised. Very often we'll see uh, extremes of instability, deep hilarity or deep depression, but more on the de depressed side uh, being the greater uh, part of their life experience and I'm not saying here that bipolar people are necessarily um, possessed. Some are, some aren't. But you, you see this very, very, very strong extremes going from hilarity to depression very often in people that uh, suffer from demonic possession and depression. Fetishes is another thing uh, that we see frequently. Um, 
and, and, and of course fetishes are associated with the occult, they're associated with uh, demonic. Uh, some years ago, back in the mid-90s, I was in a little village in Laristian in Papua New Guinea. I was there with two others doing a conference. Uh, I was up there for a week, the conference went for a fortnight. It was held outdoor and um, at the time in which I was there, there was up to 10,000 people. Later on, that crowd grew to 20,000. But uh, during uh, the uh, time that I was there, I was talking to the elders about um, this village because every year they ran a conference. And uh, they would advertise this over the radio throughout Papua New Guinea, and people would come, truckload after truckload of people would come to this little village. I'll just share something about how they came to run these and then something about what one of the village elders told me pertinent to the nature of the village. It had had, um, it had, had uh, missional activity there. Lutherans had been ministering there since the middle of the 19th century. And there was a little um, hut. Well, it would be a, a church, but, you know, it just white weatherboard up on the hill behind the village and not very big. And it was indicative of the sort of crowd that was there. There was a blind woman in, um, in uh, Holland, in the Netherlands, and she'd had a vision one night and uh, uh, related this to a, uh, an, a Dutch evangelist that was going through Waristian and, and through Papua New Guinea. And so around the late 80s, this man was in this village and he was preaching and, and God poured the Holy Spirit out on this village. The uh, peanut farmers, that was their activity there, their work, uh, fell on the ground. They all fell on the ground, crying out in deep repentance. Now this, this man is preaching and he's on the hill behind the village. The women who were starting to prepare the evening meal and lighting the fires and getting stuff going suddenly fell down and started repenting before the living God. This whole village came to Jesus in, in one evening. The village elder told me this. He said, we, we were demon worshippers, we were spirit worshippers, and he took me to the tree where they used to summon the spirits that they would worship. And he said, what we did was, he said, we brought all out all of our icons and our fetishes. And he said, we lit a big fire. And he showed me the place with the fire. And we threw our icons, we threw our fetishes into the fire. And uh, it, was, it was significant because what he told me was this. That he said, if it was the, an image of a dog we threw in or another animal, we would see the spirit of that, the shape of it in spirit form come out. And he said if it was a dog, it would come out of the fire and run out into the darkness, barking just like a dog. Well, that is a true story. And it goes back to this little village of Aristian. But every year, what they would do is they would uh, run this conference, whole of Papua New Guinea, they would advertise it. And I remember sitting on the stage there of a night watching them. And people would come in by the, by the bus load, by the truck load. And, uh, you know, the village would prepare for this conference from one year to the next. They would collect firewood so people could cook. They would put um, branches and whatnot of fire aside so people could build booths. But I remember one night there we were uh, preaching. We had this little platform with a GI, galvanized iron roof over us uh, to give us some comfort, covering and the rain came down. It just poured. And for two hours, these people, they worshipped the living God. They worshipped him and worshipped him and worshipped him. They danced and they sang and they waved palm leaves. And as they were worshipping, you'd see people begin to manifest in different parts, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we saw this and uh, people would come, come down off the platform and go and exercise these demons. 
So just very quickly to conclude this, how do we break these influences? Well, the gift of discernment tells us what the source and the nature of the individual's problem is. We need to have the gift of discernment. We need to realize we have authority over these influences because all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples. The inference is that when we go in the authority of Jesus, he says this, lo, I'm with you, I'm even with you to the end of the age. Jesus' authority is invested in his name. Then Peter said in Acts 3 verse 6, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter and John before the Sanhedrin were asked in Acts 4, 7, by what power or by what name have you done this? By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they replied. And so when Jesus performed his ministry, it was as the anointed one. And so we too have an anointing of the spirit that enables us to go around doing good, healing all that are oppressed of the spirit. In Acts 16 verse 18, the spirit of python or divination, as the scripture says, Paul took authority over and he cast it out by the spirit that Christ had placed upon him the Holy Spirit to command. So he said to them, demons go, and the demonics left for the, uh, the uh, man who was possessed of a legion of demons such as we read about in Matthew 8, 32, Matthew 17 to 18. Jesus rebuked the demon and he came out of it, speaking of the epileptic boy. In Mark 1, 23, now, there was a man in the, in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, Jesus cast it out. In verse 25, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. So when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of them. But the thing that we need to understand is you need to bind in order to loose. And in Matthew 12, verse 29, How else can a, one enter a strong man's house and plunder is good unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. In Matthew 16, 19, whatever you bind on earth shall be loosed in heaven and uh, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Sorry, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. So, you know, the activity of the Spirit is always to bring liberation, always to take the bond the bondage and break it and bring a person to freedom. Now one essential that you need to do before you get involved in this type of ministry, cover yourself and those around you with the blood of Jesus Christ to protect you. In Matthew, sorry, in Revelation twelve verse eleven, it says they overcame him. They overcame him. How? By the blood of the Lamb. In deliverance ministry, we don't pray for God to do it. He's given us the authority. Remember, demons may possess either alone or united. No matter what the number is still in the name of Jesus, that the demons are removed. Mary Magdalene was possessed of seven demons, for instance, in Mark 16, 9. The maniac from the tomb, he had a legion, Mark 5, 1 to 19. And the Syrian Phoenician's woman daughter was severely demon possessed. So God bless you. Just trust that you've learned something from this session today.